18 September 2008. Uh, we are at, or I am at the uh, New York State Military Museum uh, in Saratoga Springs, and we're doing a telephone interview with uh, Mr. James Doolittle. Uh, sir, for the record, would you please state your full name, your date and place of birth? Uh, I'm James E. Doolittle, Jr. I was born in Austin, New York, on March 9, 1923. Okay, and uh, did you attend school there? Yes, I did. I graduated from Austin High School with an uh, award for mechanical arts. Okay, and did you go on to college at that time? No, I did not. I, I uh, entered the printing profession and, uh, and completed an apprentice, in, a six-year apprentice in roughly 47 months. Wow. Okay, and do you remember uh, where you were and what your thoughts were when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was listening to a football game. I had a radio in my room, and uh, the New York Giants were playing. They interrupted the program to announce the attack on Pearl Harbor. My dad is a printer, and uh, I went down and told him. He called the uh, paper. He was the foreman of a composer room, and he... Uh, uh, he called the editor, and the editor called the management uh, the, with the chain newspaper, and they in turn decided not to, to have an extra because that was customary in those days because the radios were were making up for what was the immediacy of the news. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. I was working at the Uncle Trail Station when I went across the post office to the recruiting office with a couple of other fellows. They were too old to go. Okay, and that was 1942? You? Yes. Okay, and how old were you then? I was, uh, oh, 19. Okay, and uh, what uh, branch of the service did you go into? Uh, at that time, we were allowed to uh, specify which uh, branch of the service we would be placed in, and I requested the Air Force uh, because of my name, which was attached to the single 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 corps at that time. Okay. Uh, whereabouts did you go for your basic training? Uh, I initially went to up in the uh, camp up in on the end of Long Island, and then after indoctrination, we were sent to Miami Beach uh, for, uh, for basic training. Okay. Was that your first time away from home? No, I've been Boy Scouts and I've been camping and stuff like that. Okay. And what was uh, basic training like down there? Uh, most of the fellows were complaining because of the uh, sand and that when they were marching and doing post order drills. Uh, for me, it was no problem because I always rode a bicycle. I never, I didn't know how to drive when I was young. Uh huh. So my legs were in pretty good shape. The sand never bothered me. Okay. And. Uh, after that basic training, whereabouts did you go? I was assigned to uh, Fort Marmoth. I failed to uh, fill anything out on my aptitude sheet. So my uh, IQ was down around in the 70s. And uh, so I was sent to uh, Fort Marmoth to uh, have uh, field telephone uh, repair and maintenance and installation and so on. And I, during that period, I developed an illness and they thought it was uh, spinal meningitis and they put me in the hospital and gave me tests and were relieved to find out that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So I washed out of the class because I, when I went back I couldn't catch up with the rest of the boys. Uh -huh. So I ended up in the med hall and then at the end of that I was uh, sent to a repo depot in uh, New Orleans. Okay. Did, did they give you any kind of additional training at all? No, uh, not a, no, because uh, I was given the job of taking care of laundry and uh, and dry cleaning, and uh, I got finally got permission to go to the place where they did it. I was able to recover a lot of uniforms and stuff for some of the fellows because uh, the previous guy who was taking care of it, uh, it more than as uh, close. Uh, he, he wasn't as terrible as he should have been about his record keeping. Uh -huh. And uh, I was able to recover some of that. But during that time, I went to the orderly room and asked if I could use a typewriter. And, uh, and they gave me permission. And one day, uh, the officer, orderly, the uh, man in charge of the orderly room, I came out and he 
said, uh, what, he asked me my name, and he said, well, he said, you type pretty good. I said, he said, how come? I said, well, I took a couple of classes in high school. And he said, well, I need typists. What are you doing now? So he said, I can get you reassigned here if you would like. And I said, sure, that'd be better than what I'm doing. So uh -huh. I, went, I became a, a 405 instead of an 097. And, uh, and then uh, I started to do the typing, and he wanted me transferred to his office. But he said the troops uh, going overseas had priority. So eventually I was uh, moved to uh, the 900 single company as a clerk typist in the supply area. Okay. And uh, well, during that period of time, too, uh, he said, uh, he looked at my records, and he said, you're much brighter than that. 70, uh, mid 70s uh, IQ, he said, uh, would you like to take it over again? So I took it over again and I had a, uh, a score, I think it was 133, but it was, he said, very high. He said, you know, 135 is genius. I said, no, but he was quite pleased, so I was pleased too to get it up there. It did affect my later assignment. Uh -huh. Okay, and uh, where did you go from there? From, uh, I went to the 900, and then uh, we stayed there for our basic, for our training. And uh, now, what camp was that? Uh, it was New Orleans Air Force, uh, Army Air Force Base. Okay. It was part of that. It was a rather large complex. Uh, we were based along a bunch of trains. But they, uh, the 900, I forget exactly where they were located, but I, I don't remember the name of the base. Okay. All right, and then how long were you there? Oh, let's see, uh, until October of uh, 43, I think it would be. Okay, and then you were shipped overseas? And we went overseas, yeah, on the, on the uh, SS Alexandria, which was the third largest troop ship. Okay, did you go over as a unit or as a replacement? No, we went over as a unit. Okay, and what was the trip like? Did you go over on, in the convoy? Yes, we were in a convoy. It was very, very rough. Uh, and, and they said that was clearly in our favor because the U-boats were uh, trying to penetrate these convoys and, uh, and a big troop ship like ours was uh, really a, a prime, primary gate, uh, target for them. Okay. But it was very, very rough. I can remember going, uh, it was a huge ship and we would go down to a trough between the waves and all we could see was water. Then we would rise up on top of another wave because he could see practically the whole convoy. So it was really rough. Uh -huh. We had a guy seasick all over the place. Yeah. Were you seasick? No. Okay, and uh, how long did the trip last? Oh, well, I think probably 10 days or so. Okay. We landed in Greenock, Scotland. Okay. And uh, once you landed in Scotland, uh, how long were you in Scotland for? Uh, just, uh, we landed, uh, and uh, the Scots gave us a nice hot cup of tea, which most of you guys didn't like, but my mother used to drink tea and I loved it. And, uh, and then we were met by a band, and, uh, and then we got on a train and we headed for Ipswich. Okay. Anyway. All right, and uh, what did you do in Ipswich? In Ipswich, uh, I had been a mail clerk for the outfit, and uh, and that was taken away from me, and I went to being a clerk typist again. But then uh, the uh, we had two commanders. One was the personnel commander, and one was the depot commander. And the depot commander announced that they had to find uh, men to, who were qualified to learn cryptography because they had been informed that he didn't, he didn't have a uh, cryptographic unit in his in this outfit in a message center then he had to have one. And uh, so they looked at the IQs and so on and who are, what their assignments were and they figured I was, I was suitable for that so I was selected. And from there I went to uh, Sunny Hill Park which is over here at Ascot, England. We were in a uh, large palace that was built by Henry VIII for one of his girlfriends. And that's, a, that's what they told us, beautiful place. And uh, we learned the, uh, the American top secret. I was clear for top secret. And uh, 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 what uh, system called the Sagaba and the M209. 
designed an addition of the RAF. And we did this for about three or four weeks and we're given the test that was given the 90 day guys in the States and I, I was one of the high, higher scores. And uh, so we ended up setting up the 9th Air Force Service Code Room because at that time it was assigned to North Africa and it was sort of a secret that it was in England. Uh -huh. And uh, so uh, I, I started to, uh, one of the things, I remember we, a few of us went on requisition, a moonlight requisition to the quartermaster uh, supply unit and uh, the doors were open so we went in and we needed some office supplies, notably uh, mimeograph paper because I was able to uh, get the mimeograph paper and I knew how to cut a stencil so I made the uh, forms and they were run and that's, that's what they used in the code room. Oh. It was really kind of interesting. And then uh, I remember one thing I did was uh, I was given the assignment of decoding a message from the South Pacific and it gave all the details of losses and so on and victories and whatever. And uh, I don't remember all the details, but I remember it was a top secret message. And uh, so I was given the job of decoding that. It was a rather long job. It took about uh, almost an hour to decode the whole message. But it was very interesting. Hmm. You, felt, you felt like you were in the middle of the war then. Uh -huh. And from there, uh, we returned to our outfit because the uh, officer in charge of the code room wanted to keep us there, but he, you know, he requested a reassignment for us. But our commanding officer, the depot commander, said no because Eisenhower had set up a uh, no rating policy between units. And he was asked to uh, make us come back. Okay. So my grade eventually became first, uh, first class private private first class. But the guys that replaced us, I met some of them one day outside of when I was in Paris. And uh, and they were uh, all staff sergeants and tech sergeants and master sergeants and so on. Oh. And they were surprised that I was I was still a buck private then. So uh, I, I still, the, the, I think the biggest thing we did when we were in England was that uh, Patton's unit was uh, being formed that was a decoy and uh, we were sending, we had to keep a certain amount of coded traffic to them, which we did on the M209. And uh, we had to uh, create so many messages per day to send to them. And that was to confuse the Germans as far as the activity of the outfit. Uh -huh. But we were, we were flying P-47s and, uh, and uh, P-51s and like that's what that's what we're in our service groups. Okay. Did you uh, ever get to go up in any of the aircraft? No, I didn't. Okay. All right. And uh, I was I wasn't in the uh, in the uh, airstrip. I wasn't active in the airstrip at all. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, what did you do during your time off over there? Well, I took uh, the uh, took leaves. Uh, uh, for example, one time I went to Bath, uh, another time, uh, another fellow myself, we went to Remington, uh, the Winchester Castle, which happens to be in the school family, is a place where William the Conqueror was uh, found. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my ancient family members uh, was in that group with, with William the Conqueror. Oh. And, uh, and then... Uh, and we went to, we had a little tea shop we used to go to in, in Werewell, which was a beautiful uh, straw roof uh, building and uh, very good. We just enjoyed being there and the English were very friendly. And and uh, I, was, I was actually at a base called Chibble mm -hmm. when I came back and, uh, and that was uh, one of the funny things that happened there. The local people decided to have a uh, a welcoming for us, uh, an outing, and we went, and uh, so they were going to have hamburgers. Unfortunately, the English didn't know what hamburgers were, so we had ham croquettes, just like my mom used to make. And uh, of course, the GIs didn't like those because they used the hamburgers, and uh, and uh, but I enjoyed it because I liked the ham anyway. Uh -huh. But it was kind of a kind of humorous. Uh, they, they were very apologetic because they didn't know. Uh -huh. but, but it was really very, very nice, really. Uh -huh. Now, did you 
see any USO shows while you were over there? Uh, a few. Uh, I remember when we were at Chilbolt and we had a group, it wasn't exactly a UFO show, but uh, the Gorilla String Quartet, the name of the that came by and uh, serenaded us with uh, uh, more classical music than anything else. But as far as the, the big uh, shows, we, they, were, they were more with the active troops, uh, the combat troops and so forth. We, I think it maybe went to one or two. But uh, they weren't really close to us at all. Okay. We weren't that. We were close to the front line, but not that close. Uh, was your unit ever bombed at all? Or yes, yes. Uh, we were at the bottom of a hill, and our air base that we were at at Chimbal was up higher, and surrounding the uh, air base was uh, a lot of. Uh, 50 gallon drums of avi aviation gasoline that were being stored for the invasion. And a, a German plane came over and bombed, and bombed the airstrip, but it missed the gasoline tanks. If, if it hit the uh, end of the tank, that gasoline would have come down on us where we were camped. Oh. Okay. Now, you eventually uh, ended up going to France? With no, the uh, I went. Uh, it, and I was uh, on leave in London on, on uh, D-Day. Okay. And uh, when I returned to my outfit, all the passwords were changed, and I had, we had a hard time getting back into our outfit because they wouldn't let us in because we didn't know the password. And uh, eventually we were able to make contact and, and were readmitted and got chewed out a little bit for not coming back sooner. But we were told when we were there that to stay where we were, there was no need for us to go back because we were ninth Air Force. So, uh, so we finished our trip. And uh, one, another funny thing that happened to me: we visited a, a, a church that was built by Wren, the famous architect. And the lady was showing us. She said, uh, "Now, would you sign our register?" So I signed it. And she said, "Oh, that's a famous English name." I said, "Yeah." I said, "We were followers of William the Conqueror." And she turned on her heel and walked away. I never saw her again. <laughs> <laughs> but these are little things that are, that are humorous. And, uh, uh -huh. uh, but then I returned to our outfit and uh, we started to get ready. The first thing that happened, we were in uh, the big eight-man tents and they, they, uh, we had uh, cots and bolsters and stuff like that. They took the uh, first thing that went was the uh, mattress covers. Then the uh, bolsters and then the cots and then the tents eventually we ended up in just uh, sleeping in our pup tents and uh, and uh, it rained a lot and uh, it was just pretty uncomfortable but uh, and then uh, we had trained some on landing uh, techniques and uh, we had a obstacle course with ropes that we could climb down and so on and we had trained on that so on uh, in July uh, it was actually probably July 6th, we left our camp and headed for Southampton. We boarded a ship on the 7th, the morning of the 7th, and we sailed across to Omaha Beach. And that's, and that's when we landed on, on Deep West 31. Okay, so uh, was there any evidence of de uh, the devastation? Oh yes, uh, I, I uh, when I wrote about this, I said that I can remember going across, the sands were hallowed, and the ruins, you know, three days afterwards, it was really, nothing had been cleaned up. Uh -huh. And one of the things I remember going up, uh, the, the climb up to the top of the bluff there, uh, there was a little trail that led off to the left, and we were on break, so one of the fellows said to me, he said, well, so we got three or four of us, we walked along this little trail, and all of a sudden we came across a tripwire. And it was tied to a machine gun, a German machine gun. Fortunately, it had been disabled. Uh -huh. But uh, because of the danger of mines and so forth, we just uh, headed back to our outfit. Uh -huh. And then uh, the next thing that happened as we were climbing up, we were stopped. Uh, to allow a convoy of six by sixes with POWs on it and MPs. And there must have been, oh, 30 trucks in the convoy. And uh, they were filled with these white, while well, we realized they were mattress covers. And uh, they were they contained uh, the bodies of German soldiers going to the German cemetery that had been selected. Oh. And uh, we were you know, saying, oh, they're, they're good crowds and all that kind of stuff, but it soon quieted it down. And we, we realized that they were dead German soldiers and they could be us. Yeah. Because we 
you are in any danger at any time. Okay. And uh, where did you go next? We uh, went to a, uh, a bivouac place, uh, and in France, uh, outfits like ours were placed in fields where the using cattle were, because if there were cattle, then the Germans had to plant any mines in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we stayed there, and uh, and we're there for. Well, we were there when uh, the bombing of uh, St. Laurel, the carpet bombing, took place, and I remember watching the planes go over and see a few shot down, and uh, and just uh, and we were at a, a campsite, a bivouac area, where we were at the end of a P-51 uh, runaway, and so the first thing, first light in the morning, the sorry started, and that's all it was, was the noise of planes going over. Uh -huh. The first night we were there, I was with a fellow by the name of Stevens from Florida. He was a courier, and uh, we were assigned, we had put our, our bump tent in, in, under a tree, and uh, they came along and said, well, you have to move your, your bump tent because we're going to put a tree here. So we were put at the end of the uh, hedgerow, and uh, then we were assigned to guard duty that night. And uh, during the night, he had to use a latrine, and I continued by myself when I was at the end of the hedgerow. And all of us, we had rumors of uh, German uh, troops coming through and uh, gas and everything else. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, I heard this rustling in the bushes, and uh, I dropped to the ground, and uh, I didn't fire, fortunately, but uh, it was a big cow stuck his head through the hedgerow. Uh -huh. glad I didn't shoot. And, uh, and then uh, the same night, we had a, an air raid, but we weren't bombed at all. It was just mostly the track that came down that put holes in our tents. Uh-huh. Now, did you have... Uh any direct contact with the with the Germans at all? Did not. Okay. Not until I was coming home did I have any contact. Okay. And uh, let's see. Um, where whereabouts did you uh, go next from that point? Well, from there, uh, I was placed in the rear party, and uh, so we did all the cleanup, and uh, so that way. After we uh, got the place cleaned up, we got in our trucks and we headed for uh, Le Mans. And uh, we stayed overnight in Le Mans, and visited Chartres Cathedral and so on. And just had a, uh, uh, and I remember there, the, the little yellow bees that were around, and uh, they got to every bit of food that we had. And uh, so they were made things uncomfortable for us. Uh -huh. But, uh, and then uh, from there, we started a, uh, uh, an advanced group, and we were going to follow uh, Patton, and that was probably one of the more exciting times, because we were uh, following uh, the road that Patton had taken, yep. and, uh, and we were trying to keep up with our, our service groups, and uh, so we followed them, and uh, and we had to stop a couple of times for the Red Bull Highway, the Red Bull traffic. Yeah. And then we uh, ended up at Little Coublet, which is between Paris and Versailles. Okay. And what did you do there? We we uh, established our uh, 900 single company headquarters, and uh, and we had our code room, and uh, and really it was pretty easy duty because there wasn't much for us to do. Uh -huh. Most of the communication was by by courier or by hand. Okay. Did you ever see Patton at all? No, I did not. Okay. All right. And uh, is is that basically what you did till till the end of the war? Yeah. Uh, uh, from the end of the war, we went to uh, uh, from uh, Villa Coublet, uh the following January after uh, uh, the bulge. Okay. We Where? went to Charleroi in Belgium. Did you participate in the bulge at all? Uh, my outfit did. I do have a service star for it, but a uh -huh. battle star for it, but I, I didn't really participate personally. Okay. What was your living conditions like at that point? Uh, they weren't bad. Uh, and and uh, Silicon Valley, they were very good. Uh, we were we used a uh, barracks that had originally been a French aerodrome, and uh, they had a large cement or stone wall between the uh, 
three quarters and the mess hall and it's quite large and uh, and so we had good showers and everything else so uh, but and, uh, we got the charter right and we stayed in the schoolhouse and uh, that was kind of interesting in, in what way was it interesting well the, the uh, children uh, were trying to speak English and some of the GIs were teaching them how to cuss uh -huh. but uh, some of us tried to uh, talk, you know, speak uh, our language, correct language to them and, uh, and they discovered that the one little boy, he was in the, I don't know what, what grade he was in, but he was uh, just in elementary school, maybe seventh or eighth grade, but he was taking uh, not all just English, but German and, and uh, French and uh, Flemish and Spanish. I forget how many different languages he was learning all at the same time. Uh -huh. Really impressed us. And the people were, were very nice. And at, at that time, while we were in Charlotte, right, the, the buzz bombs came over. And uh, you just kind of watched them until they came over. Once they passed overhead, you knew you were safe. Did you see any of them explode? No, no, just just going overhead. Okay. We weren't the target. They had other places that were targets. Okay. Do you remember uh, where you were and what your reaction was when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Uh, I was, uh, I believe I was in Charleroi, and I remember it, but I don't really remember too much of it. Uh-huh. Uh, -huh. uh I just thought he had died, and that was about it. Okay. Uh, where, whereabouts were you when the war in uh, Europe ended? Uh, I had been transferred to, uh, well, actually, while I was in Charleroi, I became eligible for a furlough, and I went to Scotland for seven days. Came back, and on and uh, the way, way back, uh, we everything was delayed. It seemed because uh, there were rumors about the war ending. And uh, so none of our connections really fit well. And uh, so eventually uh, we got to Paris and then went to, to Brussels. And that was when the uh, war ended. I was in Brussels. Okay. Leave. What was that like? Was there a lot of celebrating? Oh, yes. I, I took some photographs of people celebrating in the streets. Uh-huh. Okay. And uh, when did they ship you back to the States? Okay, uh, my outfit had been transferred to Kassel in Germany. Okay. And uh, it took us a while to get there. Fortunately, I knew the code name for our outfit. And uh, so I was given the job of making a telephone call. I finally made a connection and uh, got to a quartermaster outfit and they had a truck going that way. So we got on the truck and went. And uh, we got to Kassel. The, the uh, seven day furrow lasted, I think, 27, 28 days. Uh huh. And, uh, of course, we got chewed out when we got there for, they were going to charge us for being AWOL, but they interviewed us all, and we all gave them the same story, so they said it was okay, so the next thing I know, I had a, a thing on the bulletin board that I was going to be a, a private first class, and, uh, and then uh, a few days after that, I was, uh, we were notified that we were going to be transferred to the 96. Okay, what kind of unit was that? That was the same kind of a unit. They uh, were in charge of all the single equipment for the Air Force, the Air Corps, and uh, so I was going to be in the code room there. Okay, so they were going to keep you over there for a while? No, uh, the 896 had been reassigned to take part in the Japanese invasion oh. of, of uh, what they had accomplished in Europe. Uh -huh. And uh, they wanted to get uh, the older fellows out of the outfit and uh, and then uh, so we were transferred in to take their place, okay. and, uh, and we we went to Camp Detroit, and that's where I had my encounter with some of the German soldiers because they were prisoners of war, and uh, we they were building some uh, cement buildings, and uh, they had to unload bags of cement, mm -hmm. and uh, they didn't have the strength to do it because they hadn't well fed or anything, so we were assigned to help them out. Okay. And how did you get along with the German uh, prisoners? Well, 
a little bit, but I did, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, how long were you with the 896? Uh, until I was discharged. That would be from uh, probably August. Okay. July or August until October. Okay, w were you still in Europe when the war in Japan ended? No, no. I, uh, I had gone to Camp Detroit and we came across the, on the Marine Robin and, uh, and uh, uh, landed in Boston and then I took a train to, uh, I called my folks and they met me in uh, Harmon. Okay. And, uh, and brought me home for a 30 day furlough. Oh, okay. So, and, uh, so you were in the States when the no. war ended? And, uh, and on the third, my dad had shaved his uh, gasoline uh, stamps and was able to get enough gas to go to the Adirondacks where we spent a lot of time. Uh, when I was a kid, we went on vacation all the time. Uh -huh. uh, he was looking forward to it because that we could spend, spend some time together fishing and so on. Uh -huh. And that, that's where I met my boss and uh, the foreman, the composure room foreman from Yonkers because he was in Warrensburg. And uh, and we met, uh, and it just happened to be the, the day they specified out to be a VJ day. Oh. And he told me, he said, well, when you come home, you give me a call and you can write to work. Uh-huh. Which uh, was kind of a relief because a lot of the guys were worried about it. Okay. Hey, and what, what type of work did you do? Uh, when I retired, when I, when I left the Army? Yeah. I was a, a registered apprentice before I went in, and I continued that apprenticeship. Okay. And um, I fulfilled that, and uh, I think I mentioned the 47 months, and I yes, I was uh, upgraded to a journeyman. Okay. All right. And uh, when you, where were you discharged from? I was discharged from Kelly Air Force Base in uh, Texas. Okay. And uh, how did you come home? By, by train? By train, yeah. Uh, I was able to visit the Alamo because I had to wait a little while for the train to, to get there or to be formed or whatever. Uh-huh. Okay, and uh, did you make use of the GI Bill? Uh, I did and I didn't. Uh, as an apprentice, uh, they had a program that you would receive a, a check every month from the VA, uh, but the uh, office had to fill out paperwork to for you to get it uh -huh. to, to give you your, to be your prog uh, progress. And uh, and uh, they uh, did it for a while, then they stopped. So I stopped getting any checks or anything. Uh -huh. Did you uh, stay in contact with anyone you were in the service with? Uh, yes and no. Uh, the first, uh, uh, after a couple of, they, the uh, 900 that I was with uh, both of the time, they were, uh, they had a reunion uh, several months after they came home. They came home two months after I came home. Uh -huh. and, uh, and several months after that, they had a reunion in New York. I went to that and uh, met a lot of the guys and uh, that were from the New York area. And then uh, a couple of months later, uh, they had another one. And uh, I started to drink too much, and I thought, no, I don't need this. So uh -huh. I thought, well, it's time to let this stuff go, the war go, and uh, get on with uh, my apprenticeship, because I have a lot of studying to do with correspondence, course attached to it. And, and I started to get interested in photography. And uh, so one thing led to another, and I decided, well, that's enough of that. So I've, I've been invited to uh, go to reunions. So I don't think there are any more now, but uh, but there was one in Kentucky. I, I married a girl from Kentucky, and, and it was within a few miles of her home. And, uh, uh -huh. and there was one out here at the, at the Air Force Academy, but I, I didn't go to either one of them. Okay. Um, how do you think your time in the service uh, changed or affected your life? Uh, I think it helped me grow up. Uh -huh. I was very introverted when I went in service, and uh, I was unsure of myself, and I think the uh, fact that I was able, when I took the uh, IQ test over, and I, I found out I had some skills that were useful, then and, uh, that changed me, and I became a lot more confident in myself. Uh-huh. Okay, and I noticed uh, you had sent along 
Um, a kind of uh, like, like a biography to us called Jim's Perceptions. Yeah. Uh, is, is there any anything you'd like to talk about uh, pertaining to that? No, not really. I think uh, uh, that I, I just uh, found a copy of it and I just was reviewing it before you called. And, uh, I thought it was pretty good myself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it seems like it's a pretty good uh, history of your unit and your service. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to, to add? No, uh, except that uh, the one thing that I, I did do, was, uh, which might be of interest, uh, I was one of the founders of the Color Camera Club of Westchester in White, at least in White Plains. That was back in 1952. Oh. And, uh, and I'm going to remember that group, and, uh, and I, I did a, uh, a photographic series on the Hudson River lecture series, and I gave that many, many times uh, along the, the groups along the Hudson, historical groups, and including the uh, Bronx Botanical Garden uh, Saturday free lectures, and, uh -huh. and, uh, and made a lot of contacts, and uh, just enjoyed uh, studying the history of the river and photographing it, and then the newspaper I worked uh, we went on strike and uh, that didn't end that but uh, it uh, eventually uh, that series because I was uh, chastised for having a, a story about me in a struck newspaper one of the reps asked me what it was all about and I told him and he said well we need some photographs so so I, it's a, a photographic series on the changes taking place in mail rooms due to the computer and electronics uh -huh. And uh, that was shown at the convention, uh, in, I think it was 1958 or 59, and uh, uh, typography union. And, uh, and uh, from that, I had it duplicated, and I went to the IQ headquarters training center. And uh, eventually from that, I was hired as an instructor in the training center to uh, do a lot of photographic stuff, and then eventually become an instructor in photography. And eventually, I became an instructor in color reproduction. Sure. And uh, you eventually retired and and then uh, went to Colorado Springs? No, I, I actually, uh, the training center was based in Indianapolis. Uh -huh. And in uh, November of uh, 1961, uh, we came to Colorado Springs oh. and, and established a new training center, which was larger with a lot more equipment and so forth. Okay. And, and you've, you've been there ever since? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think that's about it. Okay. I've been happy to retire ever since. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Oh, thank you.